Hello and welcome back to Many Folds, the video series where you learn how to calculate on generalized surfaces. And in today's part 33, we start talking about the so-called Riemannian geometry. In particular, we will define a Riemannian manifold and a Riemannian metric. However, before we start with the details, you know I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please don't forget, as a thank you for supporting me, you get rewards like PDF versions, quizzes and similar stuff. So please check the link in the description if you want to find these materials. Okay, and now please recall, in the last videos we have talked a lot about so-called orientable manifolds. And indeed, why we want this orientable property will be apparent in the moment we start with integrations on manifolds. For example, we could integrate along a curve on the manifold and then as we know from complex analysis, this curve integral can have an orientation. This means that it matters if we integrate from P to Q or from Q to P. So you could say this abstract orientation property actually makes sense for the things we want to have. However, an even concreter property would be that we are able to measure the distance between P and Q. So can we find such a minimal connection between the two points on the manifold? Now the problem is that for a general manifold M we cannot measure distances because we just introduced manifolds as topological spaces. This means neighborhoods and closeness make sense for points on the manifold but not actual numbers for the distance. And then, if we want to have this, we have to put more structure to the abstract manifold M. And this is exactly what a Riemannian metric will do. Now, despite having metric in the name, it's even stronger than that, because we will also be able to measure lengths and angles. And since you know linear algebra, you already know how to do this in our Euclidean space Rn. In general, we can do that by fixing an inner product in the vector space. And usually it's denoted with pointed brackets and they give the geometry to Rn. And please don't forget, you always need two vectors as an input for the inner product. And what comes out is just a real number. So for example, if you have a vector x in Rn, then the length of this vector with respect to the given inner product is simply the square root of the inner product with xx inside. If you don't know that, please watch the corresponding videos in my linear algebra series. Now in the context of manifolds, we usually use a lowercase g to denote an inner product. So instead of the pointed brackets xy, we would just use g of x and y. Okay, with that I would say we are ready for the definition of a Riemannian manifold. The name, as you might know, because it's also in a Riemann integral, comes from the German mathematician Bernhard Riemann. So now for the definition, we only need a smooth manifold as always, which means for each point P we have a tangent space Tpm. And exactly in these tangent spaces we will consider inner products. Moreover, the inner product on Tpm is denoted by Gp. Hence you could say, each tangent space here gets a geometry by fixing such an inner product. So this means, inside the tangent space we are able to measure lengths and angles. Therefore, to extend this property to the whole manifold, we need this inner product at each point P in M. And moreover, we want that they are connected in a continuous and differentiable way. This means that the map P to GP is a smooth map. What this exactly means, we will discuss in a moment. First, we should note that this map G that sends P to GP is called a Riemannian metric. And a manifold together with a Riemannian metric is called a Riemannian manifold. And you might know, usually we write such a thing as a pair. So we have M and G together and they form a Riemannian manifold. Soon I will show you some examples 
and then you will see that Riemannian manifolds for submanifolds of Rn are not so complicated at all. However, first we should discuss what smooth means in this context here. And I will do that in a very concrete way, such that we don't have any more new notions. In other words, let's just use what we already know, namely local charts. So the picture is as always, for our manifold M here, we can fix a point P and then consider a neighborhood where we have a chart. The chart map is called H and the inverse of it is our parameterization we usually call phi. And now we have already talked a lot about the following. If we have a chart or a parameterization, this defines a coordinate basis in TPM. However, since we can use the same chart H for points in the neighborhood of P, let's write Tx of M. Hence, X is just an element in U if we call this set here U. Okay, and there we have our coordinate basis, as always denoted with this del symbol. But you know, these are just n vectors in our tangent space Txm. This implies we are able to put them into our inner product we called Gx. However, of course, we can only put two vectors in. So let's take del i and del j. So we know here the outcome has to be a real number. And this one we simply call g with indices i and j. However, in order to be precise, we should also put in the dependence of the chart h and the point x. So from this definition, we can conclude that we have a very nicely defined map from m into r. So if you want, you could say that this is a map between two manifolds. And exactly for such maps, we know what the notion smooth actually means. And there you see, this is what we want in the definition of a Riemannian metric. We want that this map that sends x to the number gij is a smooth one no matter which ij we consider. Now, to be precise, we should say that this map is only defined on the set u. However, this is not a big difference because we would just say that all the maps for all the charts h are smooth. So this is what we want here. All these maps here should be smooth in the sense of manifolds. Or you could make it even more concrete and you could say after going to the lower level here, we have differentiable maps from Rn into R. But that's something you already know by the definition of smooth maps between manifolds. With this, I would say we have understood the definition of a Riemannian manifold. Moreover, we also got a local representation of this important Riemannian metric. In other words, gx can be represented by a sum of one forms. And in order to make it compact, we will use the Einstein summation convention. This means we will sum over indices without writing the sum sign. And now what we will use are the one forms dx1, dx2 and so on corresponding to our chart uh. The first one here is dxi and it will get the first vector as an input. And the second one is dxj which gets the second input here. And maybe to make this clear, let's put a circle here and here. It's not so important because we have the symmetry of the inner product anyway. Okay, and with this formula, you see, instead of giving an abstract Riemannian metric, you can just give these functions gij. But obviously, you have to do it for every local chart you have. Hence, our abstract gx here can be represented by an n times n matrix. Moreover, it has to be a symmetric matrix. And then the entries of the matrix capital G are just given by these numbers here. So please keep that in mind, because in calculations, one often uses this symmetric matrix instead of the abstract inner product. This is not a problem at all, because the information inside is exactly the same. Okay, now I think it's time that we look at examples. However, I put that into the next video, because then we have more time to talk about them. So I really hope we meet there again, and have a nice day. Bye bye.